It doesn't look like something that should be in fresh water. It looks like a cross between a swordfish and a, a trout. And then you see this thing that's iridescent and shining the way it does, and it, it just makes you look at everything around you in a different way. If you were to come across a grayling for the first time and, and look at that, and if you look at that dorsal fin, it's like nothing you've ever seen before. They're part and parcel of the experience of the Centennial Valley. So if we lost them, we'd be losing part of the valley. I came here in the fall of 2008, and the staff had been writing a comprehensive conservation plan. Part of what was in that plan was to add Arctic grayling conservation at a level that it hadn't been in the past. In the lower 48, there were only two Arctic grayling populations after the last glaciation. One was in Michigan, that one's extinct, and one was in the upper headwaters of the Missouri River. So those remnant populations are glacial relic populations, which means that they were separated from grayling that exists in the northern latitudes. Grayling in Montana had been petitioned to be listed under the Endangered Species Act, so that sort of uncertainty had loomed over everything. The animosity between agencies was high. There was tremendous disagreement on what was driving the grayling population and how best to fix it. We sat down and talked about what we wanted to do as individual agencies to start to better conserve grayling. What became apparent really quickly is we were in the same camps that people were in 40 years ago. We sort of took a step back and said, rather than debating about these individual ideas, let's test them all. We'll let grayling and their population response decide which is the best management approach going forward. Over the 80 years, three hypotheses kept being put forward. We thought grayling numbers were being challenged by competition from hybrid cutthroat rainbow trout. Another limiting factor was spawning habitat in the streams. Whether it was because of land use or natural factors, grayling may not have adequate amounts or high enough quality spawning habitat. Another leading idea was winter habitat. These fish migrate up streams to spawn and migrate back to Upper Red Rock Lake to winter. It's a large natural lake, but it's shallow. And so when you have a hard winter, you can have anoxic, low oxygen conditions, and the fish die. There was information that both supported and refuted each idea. We had an idea of how we could test those concurrently. And they would just take all of us to get it done. The adaptive management plan is really just a way to test different management alternatives. That's it, and it's its simplest form. They're described in different ways, hypotheses, limiting factors. But at the end of the day, we're just sequentially implementing different management actions, looking at the population response, and then implementing other management actions to ultimately decide how we can most effectively manage. Adaptive management ultimately is agreeing to disagree and being willing to test competing ideas at the same time with the same project. And the rest of us just tried to help in any way we could. But when they get into the deep mathematics, it's gotta go back to Jeff and Matt. Matt and I literally spent a week for each model. We had to go through that process of thinking about the mechanisms that were behind those hypotheses, collect the data, the biological information, all the historical information, and then building a model that could take the data we collected and spit out a prediction. 
We then compare the number of grayling that showed up to each model's prediction to understand which one is probably most accurately influencing grayling. For cutthroat trout, what we wanted to do was see how many grayling would be in the population at a high level of cutthroat trout, but also kind of a medium and a low level. And in order to do that, we needed to, to suppress a population in a short amount of time. What we did was set up a weir and called cutthroat from the population as they came up during the spawning run. We also called on the anglers. By the second year, the word was out. We went from one or two vehicles to 30 vehicles parked in one place and three people per vehicle. And potentially everybody coming back with 10 or 20 fish, all of which are over three pounds. People had a lot of fun. Things were going along nicely. We were reducing the number of cutthroat trout. We were collecting really good data. But we weren't just collecting data for cutthroat trout. We concurrently collect data for all of our hypotheses. The second test was to start looking at whether or not the fish have access to adequate amounts of stream habitat. What we did was take advantage of a natural fragmenter of habitat, beavers. So we're gonna work the end of this beaver dam and just make a bigger notch, make sure grayling can get up and get to where they wanna spawn. They had built over 50 dams in Red Rock Creek and essentially made habitat that was upstream of those unavailable to fish. We notched those dams in the course of a year in order to make many, many, many more meters of habitat available to fish. There's no way I could help those two guys with the mathematics or the models, but I have a keen interest in history. Some of the stuff in archival information really got me to thinking that the story hadn't been fully fleshed out. Six anglers caught fully 1,000 grayling in one day. We determined that the route the fish had taken to get to that spring head had been altered by duck hunters in 1908. And we had seen in Google Earth photos, areas of a very curvy, sinuous river just going straight as an arrow. It seemed odd. Maybe we just needed to figure out how to put the landscape back to the way it was in the late 1800s. Our colleagues who were explosives experts had it all put together, and then the time came, and it was four, three, two, one. Almost immediately, the stream reconnected to the historic channel and left the channel that had been created by the duck hunters 100 years before. There was a lot of happiness that the project had gone well, but until the fish told us it was a success, it really wasn't a success. It was just a story about an explosion. Going into the winter of 2015-16, we had had four years of cutthroat removal at that point. So the competition model was predicting a fantastic spawning run coming in 2016 for grayling. But the winter habitat model predicted a population crash. I 
I actually remember real specifically in 2016, and it was a cold, wet day. Matt Yeager was there to do his surveys. We had expected the grayling to be there by then. We had not caught many in the trap, and his surveys didn't find many grayling fish either. It was really what the winter habitat model predicted. Our grayling population had declined fivefold, and that was hard to take. The bad winter and population decline were undeniably a bad thing for grayling, but they were a great, great thing for learning. I think that was one of the first times that Jeff and I looked at each other and said, holy smokes, this is gonna work. Learning that winter habitat may be the limiting factor is in a lot of ways positive. It helps us understand what we need to do moving forward to ensure that grayling stay in this valley. As the project leader of a national wildlife refuge, my job is to try to conserve the wildlife that are native here and try to recover those that are struggling and lead a staff to figure out how to do that best. I was just in my office and I, I got a text from Jason and he had a picture connected to it. There's one. The trout. Yeah! Oh, no. H1 grayling. He explained that uh, they had caught a grayling in the spring head, and this was him. It actually took me a little bit to really understand this is what we'd been looking for. This is what we were hoping for. And this hadn't happened in a long time. This adaptive management has brought to the table history, science, on the ground management, different agencies, and problem solving at a level that transcends careers. I think the future for grayling here is bright because we're on the right track. We're looking at all aspects. We have all these hypotheses and these models. A thousand grayling coming up Red Rock Creek will someday not just be a goal, it'll be something we can accomplish with relative confidence each year. <laughs>